Hello, school directors. Welcome to today's video. Uh, today, we are going to be recording a presentation regarding the state of broadband and internet access in Washington State. And uh, I will be moderating the conversation today. I am Logan Endress, the Strategic Advocacy Coordinator for WASDA. And I'd love if we could start with our panelists introducing themselves. Hi, good morning. My name is Sharon Navas. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Equity and Education Coalition. We're Washington State's only civil rights organization that focuses on closing educational and opportunity gaps for kids of color, native immigrant and refugee by looking at the systemic and institutional uh, barriers that our, that our families um, face on a daily basis. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, good morning. My name is Mia Gregerson. I'm a state representative uh, for the 33rd Legislative District. I usually say it uh, represents South King County. I'm also the chair of state government and tribal relations. Happy to be here and thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Logan, and, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm Russ Elliott. I'm the director of the Washington State Broadband Office and excited to be here to uh, work with your group and, and these uh, super talented people on this on this call to uh, help us bridge some of these challenging times we have right now. Thank you. And Yvonne, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm Yvonne Wilcox and I support Russ in the broadband office with all the dotting the I's and crossing the T's. <laughs> Great. Thank you all very much for being here today. So school directors, we have created this video uh, and you will see others in the coming weeks to help you vote and debate on all of the legislative position proposals as part of our first ever General Assembly happening virtually this year on September 25th. And the three proposals that I'd like to call your attention to related to this topic are number 28, addressing digital equity for Washington students, number 37, ubiquitous affordable high-speed internet, and number 71, Federal Communications Commission and Educational Broadband Service. So without further ado, I am going to turn my camera off and let the attention be on our panelists. And we'll start with Sharon. So Sharon, what are you hearing from students, families, and community-based partners about returning to school online and broadband access? And what would you recommend school board members consider as they support the start of the 2020-2021 school year? Um, you know, we, we work primarily with um, community-based organizations that are either centered in um, communities of color, native immigrant or refugee, um, or are led by um, the folks that they are, are servicing. So, so the, the CBOs that we have been hearing from are really concerned about the lack of leadership and feedback that they've been getting uh, with regards to what education was supposed to look like post, um, post shutdown. And, and then also what education is supposed to look like starting this week. Um, you know, I have several parents, uh, several families, um, I'd say maybe about two or three dozen families in the Puget Sound area that have not heard from any person representing their school building, their classrooms, or their school district since March 15th. Um, we have some school, we have some families who thought that the governor's shutdown meant uh, services shutdown. So they didn't get educational services um, as of March. Uh, and um, they couldn't have because they don't have um, internet access at home, whether it's because of a lack of hardware, um, lack of device, or because they have to make the, the hard decision between buying the internet um, for their home or um, you know, buying food or adding a little bit more to the electric bill because everyone's home now. Um, you know, I think, I, I think for a lot of us, the internet is such a basic everyday utility that we use that it is hard for us to imagine a household that doesn't have the internet because they have either made the conscious choice to not get it or cable doesn't go to their location. Um, so, so for our families, they're having a really hard time trying to figure out what it's going to look like for them to go back to school in a couple, in a couple of days. And also our families have to work. Our families, um, you know, our essential workers 
in that they they do the jobs that, that most people don't want to do, right? They, they are farm workers, they are service industry workers, they're, um, they're bus drivers, they're, they're folks that are out there every day making sure that the rest of us can stay at home and work from home. Um, and they have to go back to work. They have to be able to pay their bills and the rent moratorium is only going to go so far. At the end of the day, they still have to pay, um, I'm sorry, the eviction moratorium will only go so far. They still have to pay their rent. They still have to pay their mortgage. Um, they still have to pay their bills. And, and you know, I, I, think, I think this summer we had the opportunity as a state to revolutionize what education could look like for our students, uh, for our teachers, and for our families. And um, I, I think we still can get to that. I, I just think that it was a missed opportunity um, for us to really sit down and imagine what education could look like outside the box. Um, because that's what our families are looking at, is, is a world in which they don't have internet access, um, they don't have hardware, their school districts have been handing out laptops, but the laptops have not been up to par for a lot of school, for a lot of our students. Um, you know, for some of our students, especially our migrant students and our tribal students, they um, haven't been getting any information in languages that they can speak um, and that are dominant at home. So the, the, the resources that school districts have are getting out, but they're not getting out to the students that need it the most. And I think um, we need to start centering the students who are the furthest from educational justice, um, because if we service those students to, the, to, to excellence, I believe we can service the rest of the students as well. Thank you, Sharon. We appreciate you and your organization's commitment to equity in education and your work on this issue. Representative Gregerson, you've been leading a coalition of stakeholders with the intended outcome of aligned advocacy to close the gap on internet access. How has this work been going and are you considering any legislation to support this endeavor? Yeah, well, thanks, Logan, for that question. Uh, so just a little bit of history on how this group came about was last year, I worked with Sabrina Roach before she was actually with NDIA, and there's gonna be a lot of acronyms, so I apologize, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, she's a resident in Burien, and uh, together we worked on a bill uh, 2414. And what it really did was it educated a few of us around the three legs of that digital equity stool, the three legs being uh, infrastructure that you'll probably hear more from Russ about. Uh, then you're, you're talking about devices, the appropriate devices. We know that if you have a cell phone only for telehealth, that's not adequate. That's not an adequate device for virtual health appointments. We know if kiddos are doing their homework on their cell phones, that's going to actually hinder their ability to be as successful as actually if they had uh, the old school pen and paper. Um, and then, of course, the navigator skills or the digital literacy skills that you heard from Sharon talk a little bit more about. That those three legs of the stool, if, if any of those are not adequate, then people are not able to participate in the internet world. And so fast forward to when COVID hit in March, we were able to put together uh, sort of that natural stakeholder or groupings of people that had been involved in that legislation uh, to talk about what do we do now that we're in COVID to, to react to, to these issues that are now going to be life or death for some of our, our residents in Washington state. Um, and you'll see core people, uh, Sharon being one, Russ being another, <laughs> and a handful of others, so libraries, uh, Man Monica Babine from Washington State um, University Extension, and then, uh, of course, Sabrina and staff. Um, since then, we named it IACT, which stands for Internet Access Crisis Team. Uh, I think we're basically moving into more of the sustainability of that work. But um, we probably have had over 24 meetings. Uh, we started in mid-March. There's over 100 participants. And uh, most of them self-onboard. Uh, self so they ask to be part of the group. And uh, we record everything. Everything's in a G drive. We don't really know who we're going to be able to hand that off to. I'm going to look to rest though <laughs> and hope that at some point here it can be much like what um, you'll see at the food policy forum, very similar types of issues, similar types of uh, groups being interested and seeing their, 
their space or their place in this work. Uh, you asked a little bit about legislative priorities. I think, um, first of all, there's also not just the Thursday afternoon meetings, but there's these this action team meetings, and you're seeing more priorities come out of that. And some of that's just shared learning. Some of that's just an understanding of where telehealth and libraries and nonprofits and cities and counties and schools all have these shared spaces, whether it's the K-20 network, whether it's um, dig once initiatives or an understanding of what speeds we actually need as families of four if you have two teachers and two kids um, and so a little bit of it is actually the informal groupings that are happening from the i act work where they're able to problem solve maybe using cares dollars you'll hear the city of Burien worked in um, by learning how to connect with the department of commerce and figuring out how to share some of their resources with the local school district um, so those legislative priorities are going to come from those uh, those action team meetings. I see a huge effort towards mapping and analytics, and I think Russ is doing a great job around the infra infrastructure around the speed and speed tests. But then it's about the demographics and the populations and how to how to prioritize uh, what little resources we do have, but also be ready for the federal dollars as much as possible. And the more we understand where we need the support, the better we can craft and draft our grant requests, help um, work with our Public Works Trust Board, you know, to figure out where those grant dollars and those loans, low barrier loans can go to, the difference between underserved and, and um, un underserved and non-served populations in South King County. Sharon and I know that so many of our families, if they make less than $50,000 a year, and this is pre-COVID, they were less likely to subscribe at home. So people might be able to access fast enough uh, internet, but it's not affordable. So trying to make sure that the IACT work is really focusing on those solutions that will then drive our policies. I'm very excited that the governor's team is looking at um, their decision packages and framing it up. And I think the IACT work is to really help them be supportive of that. Um, and uh, make sure that the work that they're going to propose is going to be helped in all these other areas, whether it's AARP or nonprofits or ports. So um, I'm hopeful that you'll consider your legislative priorities uh, in your tell in your virtual uh, meeting space, because again, that's going to help all of us then support your work. And you'll see requests probably around making sure that there's going to be fast enough internet to all of these areas and that will be a high uh, priority in our legislative priorities whether it's retail authority or partial retail authority and I'm sure Russell's talked more about that so um, while I haven't said any specifics I think there's a lot to come and a lot of excitement ar around this work so thanks Logan Thanks, Representative Gregerson. We appreciate your organization and leadership at the legislative level and look forward to continuing to partner in the future. Uh, moving on to Russ, uh, Russ Elliott, you serve as the director of the Washington State Broadband Office. What would you add to the ideas shared by Sharon and Representative Gregerson to strengthen statewide implementation on this uh, issue? And also, what can school directors expect from your office regarding this issue over the next year? Well, Logan, I appreciate it. Here's the first thing I'm going to add is a five-year-old. So this five-year-old right here is going to be attending uh, uh, Griffin School District for the first time as a kindergarten kindergartner. And we, you know, the, the, the need for connectivity is huge right now. And my, my, my drive to ensure that everything we do now will have a lasting impact long after he's through kindergarten is, is huge. Um, we've, got two, we've got two things going on right now. We have a short game and we've got a long game. COVID, is, COVID has introduced us to a new short game, which is we've got to get people connected. We've got to get folk, these kids in school. We have to do something immediately to help these folks make certain that they get the quality education that they all deserve. And in order to do that, we need to understand where these folks are that are not able to be connected, right? We've got to do, we've got to do a better job. And at the district level, because Washington State's, you know, we're very focused on local control, which is great. I'm a big fan of local control. But at the same time, I think we lose a lot of economies of scale by state influence when we go local control. 
So here we are with local control. We've got a bunch of small school districts trying to solve the problem on their own and nobody taking advantage of a centralized approach to where we can share best practice and how to really attack this problem. So I would encourage us to come together and collaborate more. This state is, since I've been here, the nine months I've been here, this state is famous on collaboration. We are, we are uh, amazing at collaborating and do great work. Uh, Rep. Gregerson's efforts are fantastic and it, it just shows the, the nature of collaboration when there's need. Prior, you know, co uh, broadband was an issue way before COVID, right? So I was, I was there, I was at the dance and I was the wallflower. Then COVID came and I became prom king, right? With regard to bro broadband and, and these concerns. But it's important now. And when we talk about it as a basic need, we're going to have some very serious conversations about the next statement that comes out of your mouth. It's going to be a basic need. How are we going to pay? For it? How are we going to do what we got to do in order to ensure everybody's got it, right? State's going into a, a tough time right now with regards to budget. My office is going to focus primarily on trying to chase federal funds. We're going to need lots of them. So we've just got to be prepared to talk more intelligently about what our ask is. So what I'm begging the school districts to do right now is to encourage their students to go and get on this speed test map that I have and start to record their information. If in fact we have students that do not have connectivity because they cannot afford it, please assist them in getting that information on this map. I don't need to have a computer speed test in order to have a response. If I've got students that do not have connectivity, a school secretary can take that information and enter it in there and say no, can't afford it. No, it's not available. Then at least I can quantify what that region is and what that ask is by specific district. So if one thing out of this thing, if I get one thing out of this, this presentation today, it's really need the partnership at the local level for schools that, that feel the need. I need them to go do the homework. I need them to go and start to get that and quantify that ask for me. If we've got seven students in an area and you know exactly where they are, because I can help you get there. You know, I understand how to build the networks through those things. So, and if, if you've got seven students who can't afford it, I mean, there's, there's some opportunities coming up right now. You know, OSPI has a new RFQ out that says, hey, we've got a $10 program for families. We'll pay for the year. You just need to identify yourself where you're at and can you get connectivity? That's for the people that are fortunate enough to have connectivity. <laughs> You know, for those that don't have connectivity because it's unavailable, that's a whole other conversation. But in order for me to, to be able to help address that and quantify that and, and, and help solve those problems, I need specifics. I need where are you? So anybody that's listening to this today that really feels like they've got a challenge in their district, I need you to reach out. And I need you to reach out with specific details. Not to tell me I've got, you know, I, I, I have some students that don't have connectivity. That's not going to help me. What I need to hear is I have 15 students and they live here, here, and here, and here, and we don't have connectivity because we can't afford it. They live here and here and here, don't have connectivity because they can't get it, right? Once we have it quantified like that, we can start to solve problems. I'm gonna go chase funds, we'll find funds. We're gonna get some money into this state. We're gonna figure out how to, how to help build an affordability program. We're gonna help, we're gonna help uh, stockpile uh, tools that we're gonna need for students. Um, you know, we'll build the skills, we'll do all those things and, and, and continue to work on the connectivity stuff. So what I'm, what I'm looking for right now is just partnership, partnership from the school districts and at that level to really talk more intelligently about what the asks are. And it's not, it doesn't end with our wireline technologies. I'm currently in the sandbox with some of the emerging technologies. There's a potential we'll have some, some disruptive uh, opportunities here with some of the low earth orbit satellite stuff for those of you that are geeks out there listening to this. And, uh, and that'll, that, that's going to solve some problems. We're going to have some cool announcements about that coming up in the next couple of weeks. But, but uh, reach out to me. Look, for, look, look to me as a tool or resource. And uh, especially Sharon and, and Rep. Gregerson, too. All of us are, are, are ready. We're here. And we want to support the initiatives uh, you know, at the level that we can. So thank you, Logan. Thank you very much, Russ. We look forward to continuing to partner with you and see these updates and more come out of your office. Hey, Logan, if I could, I'm sorry, let me interrupt one last thing real quick. I didn't tell you where to go do that. If you could go to broadband.wa.gov, right, I forgot, I'm sorry, but broadband.wa.gov, pretty simple. If you go there, that's where the map is, and that's where people can get that information. Thanks for letting me poke in that little. No worries. Plug. Thanks for doing it. And thank you to all of our panelists for spending some time with us today. School directors, we hope this presentation was of value to you. And we'll see you on September 25th for General Assembly. Thanks, everyone.